What's up, peers, and welcome to the World Crypto Network here for the next reading of the Bitcoin Optech Group newsletter. Thank you very much to all the contributors and associates of this phenomenal open source organization. Today, newsletter number 32 on February 5th, 2019. This week's newsletter includes an announcement of the 2019 Chain Code Residency Program summarizes a few talks from the Stanford Blockchain Conference and provides the usual, usual lists of notable code changes in popular Bitcoin infrastructure projects. Action items. Apply to the chain code residency. Bitcoin Optech encourages any engineer who is interested in spending summer contributing to open source Bitcoin and Lightning projects to apply to the chain code residency. Full details of the residency are in the news section below. News. The 2019 Chaincode Residency. Chaincode Labs opens the application for its fourth residency program to be held in New York over the summer in 2019. The program combines a three-week seminar and discusses a discussion series covering Bitcoin and Lightning protocol development with a two-month period for working on an open source Bitcoin or Lightning project under the guidance of an established pro protocol developer. The list of confirmed speakers and mentors includes some of the most prolific contributors to the Bitcoin and Lightning. The previous chain code residency focused on the Lightning network applications was covered in newsletter number 21. Chaincode is inviting developers who want to contribute to open source Bitcoin and Lightning protocol projects to apply to the residency. Applicants from all backgrounds are welcome and Chaincode will cover travel and accommodation costs and provide a stipend to support living expenses. Well, this is fantastic, Pierce. Check out the Chaincode Labs residency. It is a superb program and all these mentors here are the heroes of Bitcoin and definitely know what they're doing. Uh, so this is a great opportunity for anyone interested in making sure that Bitcoin's open source development continues. Notable talks from the Stanford Blockchain Conference. And I highly suggest that you go to the YouTube archive of the Stanford Blockchain Conference and watch the three-day event in its entirety. The third edition of this annual conference, formerly named BPACE, includes, included more than two dozen presentations across three days. We found the following topics especially interesting from a Bitcoin perspective. Although we encourage anyone who wants to learn more uh, to look at the transcripts provided by the fastest typer in Bitcoin, Brian Bishop, or the video provided by the organizers here for day one, day two, and day three. The first here is Accumulators for Blockchain, presented by Benedict Bünz. Bitcoin full nodes maintain a ledger called the UTXO set that stores the ownership information for every currently spendable grouping of Bitcoins. Currently, the ledger contains over 50 million entries and uses about three gigabytes of disk space. This allows nodes who receive a transaction to ensure the Bitcoin being spent exists in the UTXO set, retrieve the ownership information for those Bitcoin and verify that information against the signature and other witness data provided in the transaction. But what if we also ask the spender to provide a copy of the ownership information in their transaction along with a cryptographic proof that the information is actually in the UTXO set? In that case, we wouldn't need to store the whole set. We'd only need to store a commitment to a set we knew was accurate. And that could be ref re referenced by accurate proofs. RSA accumulators are one idea, among several others, for how to create that commitment and its related proofs. Using an accumulator, the size of the UTXO commitment that nodes would store on the disk would be tiny compared to the full state. Transactions would increase in size due to, due to needing to prove ownership data and a proof that they were part of the current UTXO set. But the size increase would be modest, assuming current typical transactions about 70 bytes of ownership information per input 
plus a proof that could be aggregate down to about 325 bytes per block. Other considerations affect the suitability of accumulators to the task, including being relatively new to cryptography, requiring either a well-studied trusted setup or more novel untrusted setup, and potentially making blocks take longer to verify than the current system given that accumulator verification is about 100 times slower than alternative systems using Merkle trees. In a new development compared to a previous version of this talk given at Scaling Bitcoin 2018, the speaker describes a potential major speed up to practical verification. In summary, RSA accumulators remain an interesting area of investigation into how to reduce full node requirements for storing and quickly accessing the UTXO set. This may not be particularly important now when the UTXO set is relatively small and fast, but it could make it easier to support initiatives that would change how people use the UTXO set in the future. For example, if accumulator-based proofs can indeed be verified quickly, they could also allow the UTXO set size to grow considerably, perhaps because of a block size increase, while still ensuring that miners can verify transaction inputs quickly enough to minimize the use of spy mining or the production of stale blocks. Software that uses trusted UTXO sets with newly started nodes to avoid the cost and delay of downloading and verifying the full blockchain, an option some software are already providing, could reduce the cost and delays even further by replacing the multi-gigabyte UTXO set with an accumulator a million times smaller. It should be possible for eager experiments to explore the use of accumulators in Bitcoin without changing any consensus rules, such as Tad Schreiger has been doing with his similar U3XO system based on Merkle trees. Mini script presented by Peter Woolley. In, imagine you had a Bitcoin script that gave you control over your Bitcoin to your lawyer after a year after you last moved them, in the case he needed to distribute them to your heirs. That's an easy script to write. But what if someone then asks you to join a three out of four multi-sig contract where you'd be one of the parties holding some funds? How hard would it be for you to insert your existing policy into their generic multi-sig contract and be sure you have not broken anything? Well, that's the question asked by this speaker, and his answer is the composable policy language Miniscript. Miniscript is a subset of the full Bitcoin script language that focuses on just a few features, such as signatures, times, and hashes, plus operators for combining them, such as AND, OR, or threshold. It is compact, easy to read, and will compile down to the most efficient script implementing a given policy. From an existing script compatible with its operations, it will also reverse its back into a policy for easy review. By design, it uses a similar vocabulary to the output script descriptors Wooly has been implementing in Bitcoin Core, and it can help the up data to finalize in the BIP-174 partially signed Bitcoin transaction workflow figure out who needs to sign next and whether all the data for finalizing the script has been received. Looking at the problem uh, posed to in the introduction paragraph, we can define the example personal spending policy as either you providing a signature for your own compressed pub key that is pubkey C, or your lawyers waiting for one year, that's the time log of such and such seconds, and then providing a signature of his own compressed pubkey. We combine these branches with an asymmetric OR to reduce the witness data required when following the first branch. And this would be OR of the public key C and the time which we dedicated and the public key of C. 
we can define the, genera the generic three out of four multi-sig policy similarly to using the compressed public key C. That would be a multi-sig of three of the following four keys. A functionality equivalent policy that allows more flexibility would use the threshold operation. The threshold of three of these following uh, four public keys. This allows you to just replace one of your public keys with your personal policy. So we would have the threshold of three of these three regular public keys uh, in a threshold and this uh, or uh, script of either the public key C or the time lock and the public key C. When compiled, the results is the following script. We have the private key, check sig, a swap, another private key, check sig, add a swap, private key, check sig, add a total stack. If the private key, check sig verify of this, uh, check sequence verify time frame on odd equal else, the private key, check sig, and if formal stack add three equal. Reading Bitcoin script, such a joy. <laughs> a final benefit of Miniscript is that it should allow a policy written today to be automatically translated into a structure that makes optimal use of masked Merkleized abstract syntax trees, taproot, or other possible Bitcoin protocol upgrades. And that means as the Bitcoin protocol advances, the user or developer who invests time into crafting a policy won't have to redo their work in order to continue using it with the newer technology. The speaker has provided an interactive JavaScript demo of the Miniscript compiler. And he and his collaborators also have a Rust language version of the compiler they plan to release as open source soon. Probabilistic Bitcoin soft forks or sporks presented by Jeremy Rubin. By March 2017, almost all Bitcoin nodes were ready to begin enforcing the segregated witness soft fork, but miners seemed unwilling to send the activation signal. This created confusion. Do miners get to veto protocol upgrades? If they do, is SegWit dead? If they don't, what do users do to override them? Ultimately, the situation was resolved, but it was a mess when mess that many would prefer not to repeat. The speaker identifies the root cause of the problem as miners being able to delay activation at no cost to themselves. He proposed a solution. Use the randomness remaining in a block header hash to determine whether or not a block signals for activation. For example, we choose a target that only one header hash out of 26,000 would match. A block matching that target would be produced once every six months on average. Although nobody would know how exact or nobody would know exactly when. About 10% of the time it would be within three weeks, but another 10% of the time it would take more than a year. Miners who have no control over whether or not their block signals for activations, but they would have control over whether they published that block. A miner who refused to publish his own block if it signals for activation would lose the income from that block, but would successfully prevent the fork from activating at least until the next signaling block was produced, which could be tomorrow or could be two years later. This gives miners a real chance to hold back a change, but only by sacrificing real income. The end of the talk suggests some variations of the method with different trade-offs. The idea needs to be analyzed for possible problems, but it does provide an interesting alternative to BIP9 style miner activated soft forks and BIP8 style user activated soft forks. At the conclusion of the, his talk, this speaker also announced that the next Scaling Bitcoin Conference and EdgeDuff++ training session will be later in 2019 in Tel Aviv, Israel. Notable code changes this week in Bitcoin Core, LND, 
Sea Lightning, Eclair, and Lipsec P256K1. This Bitcoin core change allows peers that your node automatically disconnects for misbehavior, for example, by sending invalid data, to reconnect to your node if you have unused incoming connection slots. If your slots fill up, the misbehaving nodes are dishonest to make room for nodes without a history of problems. Unless the misbehaving nodes helps your node in some other way, such as by connecting to a part of the internet from which you do not have many other peers. Previously, Bitcoin Core banned the IP addresses of misbehaving peers for a period of time. The default is one day. This was easily circumvented by attackers with multiple IP addresses. The solution gives those peers a chance to be useful, but provides priority to potentially more helpful peers. If you manually ban a peer, such as by using the set ban RPC connections from that peer, will still be rejected. This Bitcoin Core change adds a new Bitcoin wallet tool to the executable Bitcoin Core provides. Without using RPCs or any network access, this tool can currently create a new wallet file or display some basic information about an existing wallet, such as whether the wallet is encrypted, whether it uses an HD seed, a hierarchical deterministic seed, how many transactions it contains, and how many address blocks entries it has. This helps people who have a wallet file that has not been synced to the most recent chain tip. They can do a quick inspection on the wallet to see if the interesting before they perform the lengthy rescan necessary to import it. Developers plan to add more features to the tool in the future. This Bitcoin Core changes the get raw transaction RPC so that it will only it will now only return transactions in the mempool by default. If you have enabled the option transaction index, it will also return confirmed transaction as well. Prior to this change, even if you did not have the uh, transaction index enabled, it would return confirmed transaction if they had not yet had all their outputs spent. This previous behavior confused users. The call would work on some confirmed transactions, but not on others. And sometimes transactions that previously worked would suddenly stop working. This change makes the RPC act more consistently. Although, of course, mempool varies between nodes and changes over time. This LND change increases the default time between spending updates about what policy nodes exist on the network from 30 seconds to 90 seconds. This slows down the propagation on the network, which has grown hugely in size. In order to conserve bandwidth, Separately from this pull request, the Lightning Network Protocol devs are prepared on changing to the Gossip Protocol to be more bandwidth efficient. Although a lower update frequency will still have the same, will still save bandwidth there as well. See also this C Lightning commit for the fix this week to a bug some nodes were incurred encountering because the volume of gossip they received was so large. And this LND change dec depreciates the incorrect HTLC amount onion error in favor of the unknown payment hash error that now includes the amount of the failed payment. LND will still handle the old error codes, but it will no longer generate it. And this last LND commit disconnects any peers that do not support the data loss protection protocol. This ensures that Lightning Networks or Lightning Network Daemon's new backup format will be usable. See the notable commit sections and footnote from last week's newsletter for information about the new backup protocol and the existing DLP protocol. Peers, you have to describe to the Bitcoin Optech newsletter. And again, thank you very much to all the contributors and associates of this fantastic open source organization. Piers, again, thank you very much for joining me here today for this reading and see you on the next show. Bye-bye.